I'm your host, Francois Forster, and I will guide us on this journey. Now, our guest for this week is Jonathan Baron. Jonathan is an auditor and, and partner at BKD Auditors in Potchefstroom, and also, not so coincidentally, a good friend of mine as well. Now, Jonathan has a, a great interest in structural planning of, of people's finances, uh, your risk to, to creditors, third parties, and then also obviously how to, to maximize or maybe minimize your, your taxes uh, now and obviously part of your estate planning and things like that. Jonathan also has taken a great interest in property investments. Um, he has done a few of him on his own as well, and then also made a few mishaps and mistakes, and we'll delve into that as we go on. So help me welcome Jonathan Baron. Jonathan, welcome. Uh, good to have you here with us. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you, Francois, and yeah, I'm honored to be your first guest. Um, I must say, and, and I just want to take a, a little moment here, um, this being uh, our first podcast is just a, such a great moment and a great honor, a dream that's been coming for, for quite a few years. We, we had a chat um, leading up to this, how we, <laughs> I was in the, in the coffee business for a while and, and we tried to get it going there. Uh, and now we, we're suddenly there. We're starting this podcast and you will be forever <laughs> our first guest. Um, so welcome and let's get into it. Now, I thought a, a great topic to start us off today and it's a hot topic uh, currently in, in South Africa on a chilly morning in, in Poch of Struem. And I don't want to get into politics that much, but... Um, Solar panels and the current situation that we find ourselves in in South Africa and the National Treasury recently said, OK, listen, we'll, we're happy to, to give you a rebate if you install solar panels at, at your house. Um, and myself and, and I think a lot of other people jumped at the opportunity and, and installed solar panels. But I must admit uh, I don't really know what that entails. Um, how do you get money back? How does it work? Uh, when will you get the money back? What must be in place for you to, to get the rebate or get uh, cash? Or yeah, if, if you can shed some light and, and tell us how it will work, it will, it will help. Okay. Yeah, so um, obviously from a, a national perspective, um, there's a desperate need um, for more electricity to be um, generated in South Africa. Um, and in line with this, the National Treasury then decided to incentivize private households to uh, make an investment into generating their own electricity, at least during the daylight hours. Um, so what the National Treasury has done is to say, okay, um, we will give you an amount um, back on your taxes if you install generation, solar generation capacity. How it works is that, um, and I think maybe the first important thing about this yeah, is the fact that the rebate that you can get is only on the solar panels. It is not for the inverter. It is not for the batteries. It is not for the installation costs. So it's solely on the solar panels themselves. These solar panels need to be 275 watts or more of generation capacity, and they need to be installed in the tax year 1 March 2023 to 28 February 2024, or 29 February 2024, I suppose. Next year is a leap year. Um, you, um, need to have these panels installed by an accredited installer. And in order to claim your rebate from SARS, you then need to have three documents. The first document would be an invoice that specifies the costs of these solar panels separately from any of the other costs for the installation. So that's very important. The second one is the proof of payment for this invoice. So you need to prove to SARS that you have paid for these solar panels. And the third one is a, what we call a COC or a certificate of compliance from 
a person, an electrician probably, who is qualified to sign this off to say that your installation complies with the requirements from an electrical point of view. And that will also give SARS an indication as to when the installation happened, because obviously it's important that it happens in this year. Now, I've had a few questions about, you know, is it really only going to be for this year or will it be extended? The answer is we don't know. I think if you want to do a solar installation, do it sooner rather than later. Um, from a rebate point of view, but I think also, you know, just from a, a general convenience point of view, I think um, it's the right time. Is there a cap on the amount that you can claim? Yes. So the amount that you, the maximum amount that you can claim is 15,000 Rand. And you can claim one quarter or 25% of the amount that you have spent on these solar panels. So if you do an installation of, let's say, 40,000 Rand, then you will be able to claim 10,000 Rand. 60,000 Rand would give you 15,000, but anything over 60 you'll still be capped at the 15,000 Rand. Just a quick shout out to the sponsors who made this podcast episode possible. BKD Auditors and Orca Solar. I've got a, a, just another question on that. In terms of, I think I read that they keep referring to, to individuals. So let's say my wife and I <laughs> live in the same house, but we've got separate invoices, separate proof of payments. Is it per household, per, per, per house? I, I don't know, we didn't necessarily talk about this beforehand or prepare on that. Um, or so that you can claim double um, if both you and your wife uh, install at the same house uh, 60,000 worth of, of solar panels or would, would they, they catch on to that? Yeah, I think that's an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> so it, it is per residential unit as I have it. <clears throat> so I don't think you would be able to install, um, let's say two, from two parties at one residential unit. For me, it's, it's interesting that SARS would require a COC to be submitted as well to get the rebate. What might be the reason for that? So I think SARS with the COC, um, because that is done by an external third party, it wouldn't be done by your installer. SARS has an external verification of the actual date of the installation of these panels, which would then you know, obviously indicate to them that the panels were installed in the time window that they've given for the rebate to be claimed. Okay. And then specifically on the rebate, and this is the, the tax things that, that I don't always understand, and it's, so it's for me, and, and I would believe a lot of the viewers as well. The rebate, will that form part of your yearly tax return and you will just get a, a discount on your tax, or would it be money that you will actually get back from SARS regardless of your uh, taxes that, that you file? So what will happen is if you are a, what, let's call it a normal taxpayer, so typically a salaried employee or somebody along those lines, um, what will happen is that you will get all of your documents together and unfortunately only next year in July when the filing season opens for the 2024 tax year you will be able to submit your return and in your return there'll be a place where you can fill in the fact that you've installed solar and how much you think your deduction should be. SARS will probably then once you um, render your return to them query this and you'll have to send them the relevant documentation and after that SARS will then depending on how the balance of your return obviously looks either pay you out your 15,000 or deduct it from any uh, debt that is still owing to them. If you are a provisional taxpayer so you've got your own business or there's, there's some other income that you're earning in your own name you are already allowed to deduct the 15,000 Rand or up to 15,000 Rand 
from the first provisional tax return after you have made the installation. So theoretically, a provisional taxpayer who does an installation now would actually already receive a part of the benefit in August when he or she renders their provisional tax return. Okay, that, that is quite in interesting. Um, I want to want to tie in here with with the whole COC scenario and something that I quite see quite often in in my my day job as a transfer attorney is obviously with with every transfer we usually in the contract specified we we need a electricity COC certificate of compliance for for the electricity and what's happening now is you see a lot of fly-by-night uh, solar installers. Installers currently, everyone is a is a solar installer. So whoever they they get this contractor Facebook page, I'm looking for for solar panels, and then install the solar panels. At a point in the future, they sell their house, and we need the COC. Electrician goes out, and then the electrician finds that it is an absolute mess. And with this uh, installation, the person didn't, didn't get a COC. Um, and so, yes, it's important for, for Sasha, but I think for, for the listeners and the viewers, it's so important to, to realize whenever you get a solar panel installation to make sure that you get your certificate of compliance. It's an additional or alternative power supply. And for that, you must, must, must get a, a COC. Um, and that's on top of your normal house COC. And I just want to add there that as with now with, with the rebate, it's not applicable to inverters and batteries. So if you've not just got an inverter and battery inverter and battery installation, it's not necessary for, for a COC. So um, just remember that it's, it's very important. And I want to touch on that as well. Um, just an honorable mention to another good friend of mine, uh, uh, Farnes Boetam. I was a consulting engineer and he told me the other day, and I slipped up on, on that as well, is we all, if you do a solar panel installation, it's so important to make sure that your roof structure is, is strong enough. Um, there's, there's a method, they calculate it per square meter, the amount of weight that your roof can carry, uh, so that you make sure of that before you do a solar panel installation, because once again, People that install solar panels, I don't, they, they come, they install and, and they go. So, and you might get into trouble in, in the future, especially in a place like Potchefstroom with our summer hailstorms and things like that. If, if the weight builds up, it, it could be a problem. So with solar panels, just, just a few uh, notes that, that we need to make. Um, in our prep for this converse, conversation, we quickly touched on a gray area and which might still be a, a gray area. And if you don't have a, a formal answer, that's, that's fine. But solar panels, rebate, uh, residential or personal property, what will happen with, let's say you've got a, a rental property or rental residential property, and, and will, will the rebate be applicable to that? Or let's say you've got an Airbnb and you're making an income from this property, but it's a residential property. Yeah, so that's an interesting question, um, Francois, and I think, uh, you know, there's still a bit of clarity that we, <clears throat> we need on that. Um, the 15,000 Rand rebate is very much one that is aimed at individuals and, um, and primary residences. Uh, it does seem that SARS has some plans to also allow this for um, rental um, properties. I think maybe um, just one step back you do not need to be the owner of the property at which the solar panels are installed. So if you are a tenant, you can have them installed in the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the building that you're staying in or that you're leasing, and you can still get the rebate. So I think that's maybe an important point to make. I did not know that. That is a really important yeah. point. So it's about the generation capacity. Um, you know, it, 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 I think, or let me maybe put it this way, there, it, there has always been a deduction for businesses who install um, solar power. Um, this, without getting too technical, this deduction is in Section 12B of the Income Tax Act, um, but that has always been around. So um, I think, you know, if you've got 
you, you're renting out residential property, you need to have a look at both that section and the new one and just see where you're falling um, in that regard and maybe have a chat to somebody or engage with us about um, which section you would, you would use. Okay, that, that is great. Um, so while we're talking about rental property and, and I think the, the whole scope of this conversation would be mostly where, where our two worlds coincide, uh, the transfer of, of properties, property transfer, ownership of property, and then obviously property as, as investment, but mainly focused on the individual and residential property being the investment. And as we've spoken now about rental property, uh, I, I want to tee you up a, a, a little bit and leading up to this chat, I, I found on my TikTok channel that there's a, a lot of common beliefs in, in South Africa by normal people like us uh, about property as investment and I've been thinking on the valid validity of, of all those uh, principles. And one of them is there's a firm belief in South Africa that everyone should own property. It's ingrained in, in our culture, it's ingrained in, in our being. If you, you get married and then you must look for a property to buy, it's just how it is. The second one is with that belief that all property is an investment. You can just buy a property, it's happy, it's part of your investment plan. Um, you don't have to, to think about it. Um, it, it it's always, always a great idea. And then thirdly, to tie in with that, I recently had a comment on, on TikTok where a person said that the value of property always goes up, even goes up daily. And with, with those prompts, um, I would appreciate it if, if you can, can unpack that a little bit and, and just share your thoughts on that. Yeah, Francois, I think there's a lot um, that we can say about, uh, about those things. Um, <clears throat> I would maybe like to start by saying, um, should everyone own property? I think um, for most people, the ideal would be to at least at some point own their residence, the place that they live in. There is an argument to make for renting your residence. Um, my own feeling about that is that eventually um, you, whilst you might pay a little bit less renting initially, your rent will go up with inflation every year. Whereas if you buy a property now, your monthly repayment to the financier, probably one of the banks, um, will vary with the interest rate. But if the interest rate, you know, sort of stays the same or in the same band, you'll still be paying the same amount 20 years from now, just before you pay it off. And so while initially it might seem a little bit cheaper to rent, my take on it is that in the long term, it will probably be beneficial for you to, um, to own your own property. Um, the second part of your question, I think I, I'd like to answer that maybe in in two bits. Um, the first bit is about you as, a, a, as an investor and a, and a human being <laughs> and your situation, not about the property as such. Um, and I think what I would, would like to say there is that firstly, you need to realize that <clears throat> a property investment is not entirely a passive investment. So you cannot go out, buy a property, get an agent to let it out for you and think that you're going to pay it off over the next 20 years, but the rental that you get and, and you're never going to go look at it again or you, you're never going to have to handle, you know, issues that, um, that arise. There will be maintenance issues. There will be probably tenant issues from time to time and so on. So you have to realize that you will have to keep tabs on this investment from time to time. Yes, maybe not every month, but it will take some of your time. So if you are not in a position to spend at least some time on this property, then I don't think it is for you. Um, you know, the other thing is you obviously need to keep tabs on sort of the area around the property and so on. So it's important to know that you will be spending some time on this. The second thing is, 
not all people are made to be landlords. Because once again, you know, you can probably outsource a lot of your, the process with the tenant to an agent, but you are gonna get into a situation, like for instance, we had three years ago with COVID, where if you've got multiple properties, one of your tenants is gonna put their hand up and is gonna say, guys, you know, I've got a problem here. Um, I'm not able to pay. And whilst you need to be humane about that, um, what I've seen, for instance, with one of my clients is that since COVID almost, um, they were, uh, the, the tenants were able to sort of twist this <laughs> client's arm and say, you know, we haven't recovered for almost two years where they didn't pay rent. And, and this lady um, has a very good heart and she said, well, you know, I can't charge these people rent if they really can't afford it. They've got a young family and, and but she ended up losing her rent for a year or two. And she actually had a, we had a chat about just her taxes and so on. And I said, well, what's going on here? And she said, well, this is the situation. And I sat her down and I said, you know what? I don't think property is for you because you are gonna run into this issue again. Then you should rather take your money and put it in an investment where there isn't this human component that, that sort of puts you in a situation where you might be vulnerable to um, being very humane, but not making good investment decisions. And I, I, I want to interject there a little bit. And once again, as an attorney, and you obviously want to be humane and you want to be nice when someone is in, in trouble, but rental pro property is an investment and it's, or let's call it a business and it should bring money in. Uh, that's, that's why you have it. And I've usually advised my clients the first time someone can't pay their rent, I mean, that you know, red lights and, and you must immediately start with processes because it's uh, eviction processes, things like that is, is such a cumbersome process and it takes months to, to go down the line. So it might be that you uh, give this person rope for two or three or four months and then you want to get rid of this person, then it takes another six months to get that person out of your house. And then it's been a year that you've been without any income on that, that property. So, and so it, it makes sense. Uh, if, if you don't have the heart for it, <laughs> is it the best thing for you to, to be in, in business with? Um, but yes, please go on. All right, yeah, I think what you sketching, Francois, is sort of a worst case scenario, I must say, in all the years, I, I haven't had that. <laughs> but, but it's definitely possible, you know, and you need, to, you need to plan for that. So the second part of my answer maybe is then about the property as such. And I think your question with regards to that was, is every property an investment property? Um, now, I think there are a few types of properties that one can buy during your lifetime. I think the first one and the most important one um, would be your own, what we call your primary residence, the place where you live, where, that you go home to every day after you come from work and where you raise your kids and, and so on. Um, quite often, the purchase of a residential property or primary residence is um, a bit of an emotional one. Um, especially um, for the ladies quite often, you know, they have um, the ability to see themselves living there and raising their families. And if you get to a house where they can see themselves doing this, then, you know, we want this one. Um, so, um, my, so your primary residence isn't necessarily bought as an investment, it's bought with a bit more emotion but as a place where you and your family can live. I think, you know, what one just needs to be careful of with your primary residence is that you buy that within your means um, and that you don't overcapitalize or overspend on that primary residence. Because even if you can afford the payment, if you don't need a very expensive residence, you'll have money available to make investments with. Um, so I think that's important to just um, take note of. Then, you know, as people carry on uh, in life, they sometimes get to a situation where, you know, they've gone down to the coast in December and while they're walking around, they say, yeah, but you know, there's some properties for sale here and it's so nice 
down here that why don't we look at buying a house down at the coast. Um, and in South Africa, we're quite fortunate that property is relatively inexpensive, even though it might not feel like that to, to a lot of people, but it's relatively inexpensive. And so quite a few people are in a situation where they can do this financially. Now, once again, that property is also a bit of emotion attached. You know, you might like Belito and another guy might like Groot Brakrevier uh, and uh, someone else might like the West Coast. So you're probably going to buy that in a place where, um, where you want to go on holiday, where you want to spend time. Um, but you really need to have a good look at the area that you're buying that in. And once again, you know, don't go too expensive. Um, if we look at property and the, uh, the yields on property, um, and, I th and this, is, this is quite fundamental, you know, there are two um, st streams of, of yield, basically. The one is the capital growth on your property. So that is the increase in the value of your property every year. If you bought a property today for 2 million and you can sell it next year for 2.1 million, then there's been a capital, capital growth of 100,000 Rand. The second one is the rental income stream or the profit that you make on your rentals. Now to make a good investment in property, you need both. With your primary residence and quite often also with your house down at the coast or in the Drakensberg or in the Bushveld, you don't necessarily get the second stream. The first stream is sort of inherent in the property itself, but the second one you don't get. And I saw a very interesting graph last night, which basically says that in all the big metros, except for Cape Town, there has been no real growth. And real growth just means growth adjusted by inflation. So um, the inflationary adjustment each year has been has already been removed off of the, out, of, out of that yield. There has been no growth in property prices over the past 10 years in real terms. So that basically means that you own, your house only increased in value by inflation. So you're basically in the same position that you were 10 years ago. And so what that tells you is that you really need that rental income stream. And that is why your primary residence and a residence down at the coast are definitely not um, good property investments from a yield point of view. From an emotional and a family point of view, by all means. So as I understand it and as I get it, um, I mean, we should stop in, in Afrikaans, we'll, we call it bluff. Um, uh, well, Richard Feynman um, said that you shouldn't fool yourself and, and you're the easiest person to fool. And, and I think when it comes to property and it's especially these two emotional buys, uh, your residential property and then uh, we grow up with with Kueskom Base, Amal Vla Isibri Sea, and and you you've got this dream. You want your your place down by the sea, and you you probably think when you're gonna buy it or get it that no, yeah, we're gonna make money out of it. We're gonna put it on Airbnb, and then you you kit it out. You get your interior, everything, your linen, and 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 when you once you have that in, and your wife is it's it's her things then suddenly you don't want to <laughs> put it on, on Airbnb anymore. And then now suddenly you've got two properties that most probably won't grow really in, in capital and you won't get any, any rent, rental income from it. So it's, it's basically not an, an investment. And you showed me the graph uh, before the conversation and, and we'll put it in, in the show notes for the, the viewers. What's interesting, and, and I just maybe want to put it in layman's terms, is obviously you, you, you might get some growth. Um, you're going to sell your property for more than you bought it. But if you take off inflation, it didn't grow whatsoever. And if you don't have the, the rental income stream, uh, whether it's your own residential property and maybe when if you have a property that's you think of it as an investment property as well, you're... you're um, 
And on that, I want to shift gears a, li a little bit. In our preparation for this conversation, you indicated that you've got a, a specific set of, of rules or, or principles that you usually use if you look at a property or property crosses your, your path that you use to take a closer look or to evaluate it, whether it's a good investment or not. Uh, and, and obviously, it's not always uh, a winning module. Um, and I wanna, I wanna tee you up a, a little bit with, please share your principles with us if you would do so, but also to, to start the conversation of, you noted the specif specific uh, case where you bought a, a property as an investment that was most probably your, your worst property investment to date. So if you can tell us a little bit about the, the school money that you've paid in, in this game and then the principles that, that grew out of that. Yeah, so uh, Francois, baby, yeah, just on, on the first property that I bought, um, I think that's uh, quite an interesting story. I, um, as uh, all chartered accountants have to do, um, did my articles in uh, Johannesburg. Um, I started them in 2007 and I was renting a place in sort of the greater Randburg area. Um, ach, and I was quite comfortable there. Uh, it was, you know, it was a nice place to stay, easy access to the highways. And about a year into the lease, in 2008 in other words, um, the uh, landlord came and said, well, guys, you know, would you mind if we put this property on show because I really want to sell it. Now, there had been an, a massive boom in the property market from about 2000. Um, to the extent that properties were growing by 10 odd percent a year, you know, you could put your rentals up by more than 10 percent a year. Almost, it, it was an amazing time for property investment in South Africa, an amazing time for the economy in, in total. But um, early in 2008, we were still in that boom. So if you spoke to anybody, they said, "Well, you know, any property basically <laughs> is a good investment because we are getting these amazing returns." And so. My flatmate at the time and I sort of looked at each other and we said, well, you know, we don't really want to move and everybody's saying make an investment in property. And so we, um, we had a chat to our bank and we said, well, guys, you know, we don't really have much of a deposit or so, but would you be able to help us with a home loan? And back in those days, the bank would still give you a 100% loan and even finance the transfer duty and the conveyancing costs. So we got a what was called a hundred and seven about percent loan at that time. Um, we signed and we'd signed with the bank. And before the property was even registered in our name, we had the great economic crash of <laughs> the second half of 2008. Um, the subprime crisis in the United States, the whole world economy just crashing and burning. Um, on the back of, interestingly, you know, the way the American banks were handling home loans at the time. So by the time that property was registered in our names, it was already worth quite a bit less <laughs> than what we paid for it. But there is nothing you can do about that at that point. So we kept this property. We stayed in it until we both moved on. Um, after that, we leased it out and we ended up selling it probably in about 2019. Um, so we had it for about 11 years for, I think, about 20,000 Rand more than we'd bought it for. <laughs> so, you know, in hindsight, um, that just wasn't a, a good call, you know. Um, but on the back of the information that we had at the time, yeah, th th there's very little that we we could have could have done about it. If we've ha we'd have had that same boom for another few years, it would have been fine. Um, but that did teach me a few things. You know, the first thing is, well, you know, always have a look at the purchase price. Um, but also, you know, go and, and stress test your situation um, and make sure that you can stay in a property long term um, because you have to ride out um, the things that happen 
in the market. And you don't, there's a lot in property investment that you can control, but obviously in the macroeconomic and in the world scenario, there's a lot that you cannot control. Yeah, and, and <coughs> we, I, I do wanna, wanna delve into, into that scenarios a, a bit more, the, the stress testing. And I mean, the, we are just, just for, to, to put us in, in a, a place on the timeline, it's the 26th of May, 2023, whenever you watch this video. So we just had another interest rate hike um, and, and we'll chat about that. But before we get to that, um, we, in our preparation and everything, the, the type of principles that you apply now and have learned from that, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, having a, a good estate agent, uh, bio side, uh, looking at the price, location. Uh, there, there's a few of those. Could, could you unpack them and, and how you, you think about those? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to maybe start off by saying that um, if you cannot have all of these in place immediately when you're doing your first purchase, don't be too stressed about it. You know, um, my first principle, for instance, is I think it, the, it is extremely beneficial to go and, and build up a relationship with a good um, estate agent in the area that you are looking to buy. Um, and this might take a little while, you know, you, you, know, you might meet multiple agents, but, but you'll get to a point where you've got the one, that one that you know. They think like you think, they look at things sort of in the same way and they won't come to you with, you know, every single <coughs> property that's on the market, but because they know there's a long-term relationship that can be built out of this, they will also go to some trouble to, to find you a suitable property for a suitable price as well. And to give you guidance as to where, you know, the rental, what the potential rental is um, conservatively on the property and, and, and where it is priced in terms of the market. So I think that is very, very important. And for me, I, I have a relationship like that um, with a local uh, estate agent and, and I've benefited greatly from that um, in the past few years. Um, look, yeah, then I think with the property as such, um, there's a few things. The first thing obviously is location. Um, so especially um, if you are new to the property investment game or haven't done a lot of it or don't have a lot of time to um, to spend on it, I would say go for a newer property um, in, a, in a location where there's growth and expansion. Um, maybe don't go for an, a property in an older uh, area. You'll have to keep a much uh, closer eye on, on sort of the area if, if you're going for an older one. And, and obviously, you know, there's a lot more... Um, um, repairs and, and maintenance that you might need to do in an older property. And that's not always apparent when you buy it, even though, you know, the seller needs to disclose certain things to you, they might not even be aware of everything. And, and things do break on a property as well. So it is better probably to have a look at a newer property, uh, brand new or a few years old. What I've also found is that quite often the capital growth on a new property is better than one on a property that's already 10 years old or so. Um, so from that perspective, it also um, just makes sense. Um, I, um, as investment properties, I like properties with uh, limited um, garden, maybe a little patch of grass or so, but you don't want a property with a big garden and you're sort of expecting your tenant to look after it. Uh, but you know they also don't really want to invest in in it and so on. So, so keep it simple. Um, keep it keep it smallish. Uh, keep 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 the maintenance the ma the, the monthly maintenance to to a, an absolute minimum. Uh, and there you know um, a, a sectional title property where sometimes you know even the the outside of the property needs to main be maintained by the body corporate uh, and and the the building insurance is done by the body corporate is actually a very nice sort of property to, especially to start with if you're looking at investing. It makes things just much simpler and the burden on you much less. Um, and generally also, if you're looking at a, at a, um, 
at a yield, and we'll go into the way we calculate that a little bit later, I think, um, there is always a sort of a sweet spot in the market. It, it's very difficult to go and rent out a 5 million rand property for a, a good return, whereas a 1 million rand property in the right location, normally, as a rule of thumb, the yield would be much better on that. Um, obviously, you know, with property quite often, um, you, you make your money when you buy. <laughs> so you need to do your homework before you buy, that you're buying at the right price. Um, go and have a look at the market. And yes, you know, you can talk to estate agents about this, but we've got so many tools available these days on the internet and even on our phones where we can look at properties and compare them, that there's a lot of work that you can do yourself as well. Make sure you, you buy property that is correctly um, priced. It's something that I actually didn't think about before we started and I just want to raise it as a, as a point and if this tanks, it's, it's on me. But you just mentioned uh, all the properties in, in all the neighborhoods and, and things like that. Uh, I've heard of, of a lot of, a lot of people that believe in, in flipping houses. Um, buying an old house that's run down, doing some repairs and, and then selling it again. So, and, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask of you to address those in two capacities. One, your individual capacity as a property investor. What do you think about that? And secondly, as an auditor, um, the, the financial aspects there of uh, the repairs that you buy the house, repairs you make, then you sell it for a higher price, will that be deductible? How does that work? Okay, yeah, I think that's an interesting question, Francois, um, because we do see quite a bit of that. And, and there's a few comments that I just maybe wanna make about that, firstly from a property investment point of view. Um, the first thing is that um, there are costs to enter and exit the market when you're buying and selling property, more so than with most other investments, because you need to pay the attorney for conveyancing. There is, depending on the value of the property, some transfer duty that needs to be paid and so on. So normally one would look at property as a longer term investment because you need to sort of um, recoup those costs in the first few years. So that makes property, flipping property, um, you know, a, a more difficult proposition, but it's, it's math. In the end, it's, it's, a, it's a sum that you need to do to see if it works. So, but you need to be aware of those costs. And remember also when you sell the property, you're probably going to get an estate agent to market it for you. So, you know, you're going to lose 5 or 10% commission as well. So you need to take that into account. The second thing that I would maybe like to say about that is, um, you, I think that once again depends a bit on you. So if you are a guy or a lady who is quite handy, um, who's done DIY projects all your life, uh, and who's comfortable doing a lot of the renovations that you need to do in order to flip the property yourself or with um, subcontractors, then it might make sense. If you are an auditor like me, who um, prefers to make use of other people <laughs> to tile your floors and paint your walls and so on, then it becomes a lot more expensive to do these renovations. Um, it's less time consuming, but it, it's a lot more expensive. So what I've seen with, with flipping properties is that you need to be very hands-on and you need to know and do quite a bit of that yourself or supervise a lot of that yourself and then it can work. I've, I definitely have friends and, and, and clients who've done this and who've, who've done well. But especially with flipping properties, the uh, price that you buy at is absolutely crucial because you have no time for the market to grow into a, uh, into a price. You're basically looking at a four, hopefully not more than a four month window in which you need to get rid of this property again. Um, so you need to buy right. 
BKD Auditors is a multidisciplinary audit, accounting, tax, and advisory firm. They seek to add value to their clients through building long-term relationships, allowing them to design tailored solutions while giving you, the client, the peace of mind that your financial compliance needs are taken care of. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And it, it pretty much takes us into our <clears throat> the next part of our conversation. And what you touched on, and it's something that I see as in, in a lot of the transfers that I do. And there's this, most of the things we buy, all the costs are already included in the purchase price. I mean, we, we bought this cup of coffee here now, and the price you pay is, is the price you pay. Uh, the, the beans, the water, the making of it, the taxes, whatever the case might be, is already included in the price. And I want to, to chat about a, a bit about the, the costs of, of property. And we're going to talk in a lot, of the, a lot of different directions on that. But what I find lots of times is people have this, or buyers especially, this big divide between the price tag on the house and then all the other costs they, they must pay. So they, okay, they've got a budget of 2 million rand. They know they can get a, a bond for 2 million or they have 2 million cash. So they look for houses for 2 million rand. And then, as you said, emotionally, wife sees a house, great and might usually see a house that's a little bit more expensive than two, two million and fifty or whatever the case might be. And then we start the transfer process and me as a transfer attorney, I send my account and I'm like, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> um, why, why are we, and the additional costs, they didn't necessarily think about them or they didn't know about them. I, I find lots of times or they aren't prepared for them and they don't see the whole package um, as, as part of, of the cost of the property. And then as you correctly indicated, I think especially if, if you are going to sell your property within a serious, seri uh, certain time frame, you must keep in mind that you're going to have to pay an estate agent as well in three years, four years, 10 years. And that's going to be a large chunk of, of the money. It's going to be 5%, it could be 100,000 Rand. Um, and those costs, you, you need to, to include those. Um, what are your, your thoughts on that? Uh, how you should think about those costs, uh, the different types of costs that you get in property and that people should keep in mind when they decide to, to buy a property? Yeah, thank you, Francho. Uh, if I may, I would just like to go one little step back um, and I'll answer this question now, but to the flipping of properties, just from an auditor's point of view. Um, I think the important thing that you need to note when you are flipping properties um, is that if you buy a property as an investment and you hold it for a number of years and you sell it, then that sale is what we call a capital gain. So it is, um, it gets taxed um, under the capital gains tax regime. If you sell that as an individual, then it means that only 40% of the profit that you've made is added to your taxable income and you pay tax on that. If you are flipping properties, then the, um, the money that you make, the profit that you make is not a capital gain. It is of an income nature, and you are gonna pay tax on 100% of the profit that you make. And that is also just a big difference that you just need to be aware of. Look, obviously if you're making money, you've probably done well, and it might still be worth it. But I often get guys that come in and they say, oh, but this was a property that I sold, so it must be a capital gain. No, it depends on your intention. It's a capital gain if you were intending to keep it for a long period, you did. If you were intending to just flip it, it's not. 
Um, so that, I think, is, I just wanted to, to, to clarify that and to get that in there because I think that's a common misconception. That is, is a very important point and some, I don't know it. Uh, so it's, it's something I learned today and, and we're moving into costs, uh, but while we are on capital gain, which is a, a cost, let's, let's kick it off with, with capital gain. I, I see a lot of people on my TikTok channel, a lot of questions on, on capital gain, capital gains tax. How does it work? Uh, what is it? What does it mean in, in principle? Uh, in, in concept, uh, it's, as you say, okay, you, it's, it's only 40% forms part, part of your, your, your taxes, but what does that mean <laughs> for a, a normal person like me? And, and we get, um, I see a lot of transfers in, in Porch of Strum that somebody bought a, a, a house or a, a plot uh, in 1990 and now they want to move to to the land or whatever the case might be. They sell it now, and there's a they bought it for a hundred thousand rand, and now suddenly they sell it for for three million rand. Um, so if you can can unpack uh, unpack in 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 a way capital gains tax maybe for us a bit, uh, and yeah, how does that impact our lives, and how must we think about that? Because that's not a a common cost that we equate with, with property. We, we think about transfer costs, bond costs, uh, these type of things, but, but I think capital gains, when you sell your property, that tax is only coming to you down the line in six months, a year, whatever the case might be. So we, we kind of forget about it. So where and how does that play a role and how should we think about it? So first things first, if we're talking capital gains tax, then, you know, I think, um, we should congratulate the investor because he's made profit on his investments if he's looking at that. So um, how capital gains tax basically works is that it is a, a once-off tax on a transaction where a capital asset, so an asset that an investor has bought and kept for more than a year or so, um, is sold and um, the gain that is made on that um, investment is then being taxed. So if we look at that specifically for property, um, then there are two very important concepts without getting too technical. Um, if we look at capital gains tax, the first thing is what we call proceeds. So that would be the money that you have made um, from uh, the sale of the investment. And the second thing is what we accountants or auditors called base cost, so the costs of this property, and we'll get into those quickly now. So proceeds, I think, is quite simple. Um, probably the price that you've sold your property at, but there might have been certain costs that you picked up in the transaction, which obviously you can um, deduct. Um, cost or base cost is a bit of a more interesting concept, and there are a lot of technical things about that. I don't want to get into a lot of that today. Um, capital gains tax was introduced here on 1 October 2001. If you are selling a property um, that was purchased before that date, then I would suggest that you go and talk to a auditor or an accountant about your capital gains tax sum because that gets quite complicated and I don't, we don't have time to, today to get into that. If you've bought a property after 2001, then your base cost would be the cost that you paid for this property, and that would include um, all of the once-off costs, and we'll get into those a little bit later, and then any further costs that you have incurred over time to um, advance the, the value of the property. So not repairs and maintenance that you would typically you know, deduct off of your rental income, but, um, you know, any big um, things that you've done with the property where you've increased the property's value, like a, adding on a room or a major revamp, putting in a new kitchen or, or something like that. Um, so basically for capital gains then, you would deduct your base cost from your proceeds and get to an amount. This amount, if you are an individual 
40% of this amount gets added to your taxable income. You not tax that 40%, that's important, it gets added to your taxable income, and your taxable income then gets multiplied by the percentage of the tax bracket that you are in. So that might be anything from 18 to 45% if you are a very high um, income earner. Um, so effectively, as an individual, the highest rate that you could pay capital gains tax at is 45% of the 40% that you've made. So basically about 18% of um, the profit that you've made. Um, when you buy or when you sell property that sits in a different uh, legal entity, not in an individual's name, in a, a warm body's name, um, then it works a little bit differently. Um, but you, then you include 80% of the gain that you have made on, uh, on the property. Okay, and I know previously we, we've worked together on, on a few things and I know there's, I don't want to call it a simple e equation, but there's a few set principles how to calculate uh, capital gains tax if you have the input values and, and things like that, when you bought the property for, for what, and you can get a good idea uh, what your capital gains tax should be. So for the interested viewers, uh, we will try to, to include that calculation in the show notes. So keep an eye out for that and see if we can, if you wanna uh, do that calculation for yourself, you can do that. And yeah, so keep an, keep an eye on that. And then if, if we can move then back to the costs. Um, the, the other costs that should be kept in mind when it comes to, to property, the actual expenses of that. Uh, what, what are those? Uh, when are they <laughs> due, owing and payable, if we can, can call it that? And you mentioned an, an interesting earlier thing earlier is, is your, the most important period or the most important thing is, is when you buy the property. And I think a lot of investors or a lot of people think about property when they will sell the property. That's where the profit will come from. And, and I see so many people holding on to their property. Uh, they already moved to another property and they are holding on to the current one because they want a certain price for that property. And they, I've seen people holding on to it for a year, year and a half, it's standing empty and they want the, the price. And, and I think that is exact opposite of, of what you're saying, that the most important time for your profit or your investment is actually when you buy the property. What are those costs? Um, I, I know we talked about once off regarding buy and sell and we talked about monthly costs. So if I can, can tee you up on that, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think let's break that down in, into a few um, areas, uh, Francois. Um, let's start with the once-off costs and maybe with the once-off costs, firstly, when you're buying a property. Um, so um, the things that you need to be aware of, if you are buying a property um, that is not entirely new, I'll touch on buying a property from a developer uh, as a second part, but let's say we're buying this from another individual or at least not from the developer. Are you buying from me? I'm buying from you, let's say. Then there are a few costs that I'm going to incur. The first thing is unfortunately if the property is worth more than 1.1 million rand, you are going to incur transfer duty, which is a transactional tax that's payable to SARS on the value of the property. And it is the purchaser who incurs the transfer duty. So that's important to note. And generally, the bank will not finance this transfer duty. You will have to come up with that yourself. Then, unfortunately, attorneys don't work for free. So you are going to have to pay the bill of your transferring attorney. Um, in, in, in our 
property sector, um, I've always found it a bit strange that is, it is the seller who appoints the transferring attorney, but the buyer needs to pay uh, this <laughs> attorney. But that is the way it works. Um, so um, you, you'll have to pay that attorney. Uh, and those costs, are, well, you can talk about that a little bit more, but that works on a sliding scale as I have it. Um, the third thing would probably be if you are buying this property and you need to finance it, then there will be a bond that needs to be registered um, for the financing institution over this property and there is a certain cost to registering this bond and you will have to pick up that cost as well. Um, and even that, uh, you know, normally also works on a bit of a sliding scale um, and um, there, are, there is some guidance regarding this, so maybe in the, in the notes to the um, to the, the podcast, we can also touch a little bit on that or give an indication of what this might be. I, if I can interject, I, I just I just want to touch on it quickly, and I don't want to do a get get into a, a monologue or a tech. TED talk here <laughs> about costs of property. Um, but being a transfer attorney, um, we, I see that so often and buyers not really knowing what it is going to, to cost them. And I don't know if they didn't prepare or they didn't do some research, um, but it is the case. And as you say, it's a sliding, uh, sliding scale. It's not a percentage based. Usually, especially the transfer attorney and the bond attorney, the more expensive the property gets, the in percentage wise, the, the amount they are getting gets less. Um, and I also find the more expensive the property gets, the more buyers try to, to negotiate regarding a, a discount. Um, so uh, that happens, and but I find the inverse with transfer duty. Uh, transfer duty is manageable up to a certain point, and then I find here about 2.2 million to 2.5 million, suddenly it, it yeah. gets hectic. <laughs> it, it gets a lot that you have to, to pay to such in, in terms of, of taxes for the property. And as you said, we'll put it in the show, show notes. Uh, you can visit our website, uh, francofoster.com. There's various calculators there. You can play around with, put the, the, the purchase price of the property in and you'll get a clear indication what would be your transfer costs, your bond costs, and the transfer duty payable. And I usually find if we, usually the transfer attorney, his, pro forma account will include the transfer duty, but if you forget about the transfer duty for a while, the transfer attorney and the bond attorney, their accounts would, is usually pretty much the, the same. Once again, I, I find people getting a little bit <laughs> amped up about it regarding the costs, but these costs are, are set by our council, uh, by, by the Legal Practice Council, uh, proposed costs that, that we need to adhere to. Uh, as you say, don't really want to work for free, um, but, it, but it's part of, of the cost. So yes, on our website, you, you can go and play around with the cost and see exactly what, what you will be in for. All right, yeah, and then there might be one or two small costs. Um, the cost to obtain clearance figures for the property from the municipality, uh, but those costs are normally negligible. Uh, they won't make a big difference in, um, in the sum. Um, if you are buying from a developer, then the, there is normally no transfer duty on the transaction. Um, I don't really want to get into the reason why now, but, but you can, um, it's important to make sure of that when you're buying from a developer, but generally that would be the case. And uh, generally, the developer will also pick up the tab for the transferring attorney. So those two costs you would save. And that's why quite often with a new property, you just need to be aware of that because you, if you're buying a property from somebody else, you know, you might end up paying 100,000 Rand more or so than the list price because these two costs are not included. Whereas with the, the developer, 
with the new property they normally are. So generally, if you're buying a property from a developer, the only cost that you would really pick up is the bond registration and then these small ancillary costs that we've just spoken about. So that's an important difference to note. Um, those are the ones of costs if you're buying. If you are selling, then um, except for the capital gains tax, which we've spoken about, but once again, that means you've made profit, so don't worry too much about that. There is the biggest cost that you normally incur is the um, commission of the estate agent. And once again, generally I found that if you have a relationship with an estate agent, then you can negotiate with them a little bit about the percentage of the transaction that goes to them as a commission because they also know that you are a repeat customer. Um, this generally can be anything from about 5% plus VAT to 10% or so um, as a rule of thumb. But that is a significant portion because remember that is on the sale price. Um, so for a 2 million rand property, that's going to be 200,000 rand or between 100 and 200,000 rand. So that's a significant cost. Um, you will need to get a certificate of compliance from an electrician once again, and this time not just for the solar installation, but for the whole property. Um, the, the certificate as such is normally not that expensive, but what tends to happen, especially with all the properties, is that um, there are certain things that need to be fixed at that time for the electrician to be able to give you the certificate of compliance and, and you, will, you as the seller will need to pay for those. Um, there will also be a small fee for deregistering uh, de the bond or cancelling the bond at the, the deeds office. Um, and, uh, but that is generally uh, a lot smaller than the registration of the bond. Um, and um, yeah, then ach, there are once again small ancillary costs that uh, one, yeah. one needs to look at. I, I think just from my day-to-day -day experience, before we move on to, to monthly costs, I can just color in the picture, but <clears throat> for our viewers, the bond cancellation is usually between four and 5,000 Rand. Uh, so that's, yeah, as you say, in the, in the bigger picture, it's it's not that much and I think what what sellers miss is they sit with the estate agent and they negotiate a percentage okay it's going to be five percent plus VAT or it's going to be seven and a half percent plus VAT but they never actually make the sum yeah. <laughs> how much is that in rand um, it's going to be 200,000 rand or plus VAT 230,000 rand and that taken off, uh, your, your selling price is, is quite a substantial chunk. And you have to remember as well that you have to pay the bond off. So there might be, let's say you sell your property for 2 million rand, 230 goes to the estate agent, and there's, let's say there's a million left over on your bond. So suddenly you're getting, if my calculations are correct, only 670,000 of the total sale, sale price. And a person that, that I like to follow, Ramit Sethi, he's got some interesting views regarding property and especially uh, your, your primary residence and how long you should live in it. And he's got a kind of also a, a few set principles and I'll, we'll link to that in the show notes. But he says, you, if you buy a property, you should live in that property for 10 years or, or more. And you alluded earlier as well that when you visit a property with your wife, she sees the kids growing up there and, and everything. And I think that should be the, the idea. Otherwise, you've got all this once-off costs at the start, bond attorney, transfer attorney, transfer duty. Let's say that's 150,000 on top of your, your 2 million. Uh, and then let's say you, you sell that property within three years now add on top of that 230,000 that goes to the estate agent, uh, your COCs, the worst one I've seen with the repairs was 27,000 rands worth of repairs that, that uh, a, a friend of mine had to, had to do on the property before they could get the COC. You didn't bargain for that, you didn't budget for that. That comes out of your pocket up front. 
and then obviously the municipal fees and, and so you bought a property for two million, you sell it in five years for let's say 2.2 million, you think, yeah, I, I had a good deal. Um, but if you add all the expenses, suddenly you made a substantial, substantial loss in, in cash, in cash flow. Um, so yeah, just, that's just from, from my experiences to date and that people should keep in mind is to properly look at the buying of the property, but also the selling of the property and what will this property cost you in, in the, the, yeah, in the long run. But then also there will be monthly costs. Yes, that's correct. Maybe just one last cost of, of getting out of the market, Francho, and, and you've done nice material on this, is also that there will be a cost from the bank side um, to cancel the bond um, from at the bank itself. Um, and depending on how much notice you've given and so on, you know, that, that might differ. But um, I'm not going to get into the detail of that now. Uh, there's nice material available about that. Um, monthly costs, <clears throat> if we are renting out a property, um, are quite often the thing that will make or break uh, the investment going forward. So the first monthly cost um, would be the rates and taxes to the municipal authority. Um, <clears throat> and depending on which municipality uh, you are in, that might or, or how old the property is generally that you are renting out. That might be rates and taxes, normally water, um, maybe even electricity as well. Although I would urge you if you are, um, you know, gonna lease out a property to, to install a prepaid uh, electricity meter. Uh, you don't wanna get into a situation where a tenant leaves you with an unpaid bill for three or four months worth of electricity after they've gone. It's, it's not, uh, not something that, that you really want. Um, so, so those fixed costs you will need to cover. <clears throat> um, normally the electricity and the water gets recouped from the tenant um, themselves. So that's not for your pocket. If you are, uh, if, if the property is in a sectional title scheme or in a, an estate where there is a homeowners association, there will be a levy from this uh, body corporate or homeowners association. That can, depending on the type of property and the location, be quite substantial. You know, if you are buying a property in a golf estate or something, you know, that tends to be quite a, a heavy burden. If you are just buying it in a smaller um, setup, that normally is to cover the security and, and a few of those things and, and it will be a bit more palatable. Um, the other big monthly cost, depending on how you are doing your rentals, would be the commission of the estate agent that is um, marketing this property for you and quite often doing a bit of the management of with the tenant as well. And once again, you know, this can be anything from about, well, I'd say 8 to 12 percent or so of the monthly um, rental. Um, so that is a significant cost and it makes a very big difference in your, uh, in your sum at the end of the day. And then I think a big one that is quite difficult to quantify is repairs and maintenance. Um, unfortunately, even with new properties, um, things do break. If you're buying a brand new property, normally in the first few months, if it's something that just wasn't put in properly, then um, the developer will come and fix it. Uh, but if you're buying a slightly older property, the geezer does break, um, <laughs> you know, and there are <coughs> or certain other costs. So <clears throat> if I look at, at maintenance costs, if I'm buying a brand new property, I, I budget for very little maintenance in the first year or two, three. But any property that's older than three or four years, I tend to take about a 10% um, out of the monthly rental and say, well, you know, I'm going to budget that 10% when I do the maths about the yield on this property for maintenance. Um, some guys will tell you that that is a bit excessive, but you know, I'm an auditor. I like to be conservative with these things and I don't want to get caught out because um, it, you don't incur this every month, obviously, as well. So what tends to happen is 
you know, you need to do something big and then you need to fork out a lot of money and certain, suddenly you see, hey, but I'm having a problem here. Yeah, that just, yeah, it, it makes sense. I mean, if, if you build that up, you have it to your disposal. And if you see in a few years that you don't need it, well, then you can use it, go on holiday, treat your wife, what, whatever the case might be. Um, in terms of, of costs, I uh, want us just to quickly touch on, on two more points that we talked about in preparation. And those points are as follows. So two pertinent points we touched on in, in our pre-coffee, and, and I think we've addressed a lot of those points already, is, is the cost of moving in and, and into the market and out of the market. And we must remember it's for the same property, so that will have a, a substantial impact on the calculations of, of your cash flow and your money. And then also the second thing that you mentioned the other day is where you get into a situation where you must sell. And that's actually a situation that you never want to get, get in. Um, what, what's your thoughts regarding that? And I, and I think that it's a pertinent time to talk about that because if you take the last year and a half in South Africa, with the amount that interest rate rates increased, you more on a two million rand bond, you're most probably now paying 5,000 rand a month more for that bond. So if you were already capped in your budget and you didn't have any fat built into your budget, you've got a, a big problem now. Yes, you do. So I think, you know, it, you never want to be in a situation with a property where you need to sell it um, or you need to do fire sale on it, let's say. Um, you have to get rid of it because you can't keep up with the costs or, or there's some other financial constraint that's, that's getting you down. Um, unfortunately, you know, then you, it takes time to market a property uh, to get a good price for it. And, and if you get, need to get rid of it now, you won't get the price that you should be getting for the property. And obviously that is severely going to affect your yield on that property. Um, I think it's important to stress test your um, model uh, and, and the maths that you do around buying your property. You cannot go and buy a property at the absolute high level mark uh, of where the bank will give you a bond and, and what you can financially afford. That is not a good decision to make. You need to go and have a look at the costs and everything and say, well, you know what? What if the interest rate rises by another 5%? What will my repayment be? If I cannot afford that, and, and, and in current Times, I would say you need to have a look at if the interest rate is 15 or 15 and a half percent. I'm, I can't see us getting there, but stranger things have happened. Um, you, you don't want to get rid of that property then because you're also not going to be the only one in the market then. We're going to have a lot of other guys that need to sell. So that is going to push down prices. So if you can't afford the property at a 15 or 16 percent interest rate, then you really don't need to buy that property and you have to have a look at a slightly more affordable property. Um, so that I think is, is of the utmost importance. You cannot just look at where the interest rates are now and that is a very pertinent question because somebody who bought a property just after COVID, when interest rates were at a, I don't know, a 50 year low, <laughs> um, <laughs> is feeling the effects of this now, as you've, as you've just said, and those people are under pressure. Um, you don't want to be in that situation, not only because of the, the loss that you might make, but this is going to give you sleepless nights and, and emotionally, it's definitely going to have an impact. It's so interest, interesting what you're saying because, I mean, that's exactly the opposite of, of what we all do. I mean, we start and we think, okay, I want to buy a property. So what do we do? We go to a bank, we get a pre-qualification. You pre-qualify for a 2 million bond. And what do we do? We search for a property for 2 million. Um, and that's actually not how we should go about it. Firstly, we haven't thought about the costs whatsoever, uh, what it will be the cost to be or get into the, the market. We're buying at the 
utmost, utmost top of, of what we can afford. And then if something goes wrong, and if, if the viewers want to read things on, on that, I mean, Nassim Taleb has got great books about being anti-fragile, is to set ourselves up that we, you, you can weather a knock or weather a storm. And we have to prepare for things that we didn't think will happen. Um, and, and I know it's difficult to do that, but nobody thought something like COVID was, was possible. But it did happen. Nobody thinks at this stage we will go to 15% interest rate, but it might happen. And, and what then? And you, you might think, okay, but then I'm going, it's going to be 10,000 Rand more on my bond, but that won't be the only cost that will go up. Um, it will be food, it will be petrol, it will be fuel, whatever the case might be. So your, your total budget will take a, a substantial knock. Um, in, in this, you, you touched on yield and, and how you think about uh, profit, making money on, on property, uh, investment property. Do you have a, a specific way that you think about it? Capital, rental income, do you have a specific model that you, that you follow, that you insert your figures that, that assists you with, with that? Yeah, no, I, I definitely do, Francho, over time, uh, you know, I've been able to, to build up a model into which I can plug um, a few of the figures and, and just, that just gives me an, an indication of the yield. Um, I think um, the, the, the first thing and, and the most important thing is that we people often go wrong with evaluating a property um, is that if you are not buying the whole property cash, um, then when you look at your yield, you really need to look at the yield on the money that you put in. So if you are buying a 2 million rand property, and you are putting down a 10% deposit and let's say another 100,000 Rand in costs, then you have incurred 300,000 Rand that you don't have in your pocket after you've done the deal. Now, if you are fortunate enough that the rent covers the um, 90% that's left or the, the bond costs and, and, and the monthly costs on, on whatever's left, then the 300,000 is really the investment that you have made. And it's on the 300,000 that you need to go and work out what your yield is, not on the 2 million or the 2.1 million Rand that you've actually paid for this property. Because in effect, that is not what it has cost you to do this transaction. So what you'll often find is that somebody will go and say, okay, but you know, if I get 4% capital growth and I get this rental, mm, you know, my, my yield on 2 million Rand is only eight or nine percent that's not great i can almost get that um in a far risk, less risky investment as well but what i'm saying is i don't that's not the right way to go about it go and have a look at the yield in terms of the money that you have put in what you've taken out of your pocket and put into this property and we can talk about that a little bit more but that's also something that you you can do it at the start but it's something that you need to sort of do every two to three years to say, well, what's this property worth now? So how much of my money is in here? If I sell it now, what am I going to get out? And is the yield that I'm getting on that um, worth it for me or not? Or is it time for me to, to maybe get out of this property? Um, to explain the whole model, I think, is going to be difficult. Um, but... Um, I am more than willing to share um, the model and so, so that the, uh, the listeners and the viewers can, um, can plug some of the figures in there themselves. I, I would advise though that obviously once you've done that, you just go to, to a person, especially if you're new into this, uh, that has you know, seen this sort of modeling before and just to get an opinion yeah. about it. Okay, that, that'd be great. And, and we'll see if we can put it together in such a way to, to share it in the show notes for everyone. Um, and as Jonathan alluded to, is what, what we're doing here is not, not financial advice or anything. We're just talking generally. So whatever <laughs> you hear, whatever strikes you, whatever, whatever touches you, make sure that you speak to, to someone uh, that's, that's knows about your situation, your finances, and that can guide you regarding that. I, in, in, 
light of our conversation, I ask um, on, on our channels and on TikTok if people have certain questions for us. And Claim Gear asked, and, and it touches with this, that's why I, I throw it in here. Uh, as a new professional, would it be wise to purchase a house and, and renting it out, i.e. having the tenants pay the bond off? Um, advice, do's and don'ts, and that's basically what, what you talked about now, the in, you in for 300,000, but then obviously you've got someone that rents the property that's technically paying the bond, you're not paying the bond. Yeah, that's right, for instance. So, so that's, what, that's where you want to be. One important point I think that I just want to make about that, and this is with my auditor hat on um, a little bit more again, is that there is a common misconception that if I look at my profit from my rental properties, um, that you know, if I receive my rental income and I deduct my bond and my costs from that and there's basically nothing left, then I'm breaking even so I'm not making a profit. That is not the case. In your bond payment, your bond payment basically consists of two different um, things. The first thing is the interest that you are paying on the money that you've lent from the bank at the 11 or so odd percent interest rate that, that you've on, in the agreement have with the bank. And, and that interest is deductible from your um, income on the property. But there is a portion of that bond or of, of that amount every month that is um, paying off the actual loan at the bank. So by which your loan reduces every month so that over 20 or 30 years it, it, it's at zero. Um, and that portion is not deductible for tax because you are using that to pay off an asset. That is not an expense. And it's a quite common misconception that for tax, in other words, you can deduct the whole um, bond payment. That's not the case. So just be aware of that. Quite often at the start of the bond, the interest is very high because the, the loan is still very big and the impact of that little capital portion is small. But as you are paying off more of the bond, the interest becomes less and the capital portion becomes more. And so with the same net cash flow every month, your tax taxable income on this actually becomes more. So don't be fooled by that and get some advice on the impact of that because you might end up having to pay income tax on your rental income even though you haven't actually made cash uh, on it. Are you a business owner, farmer or individual who owns a building? Then you need to speak to Orca Solar to find out how you can save on electricity cost and make load shedding a thing of the past. They are a specialized alternative energy company founded on the combined passion for engineering and economics. With their professional engineers and qualified installation teams, they've been doing solar installations for over nine years. Find out how they can help landlords, farmers, hospitals and hundreds of households across South Africa with uninterrupted power supply that makes financial sense. Basically, they can help you. Contact the professional team for a free consultation. If you want to do it right, you do it with Orca Solar. That's a very interesting point, and, and I see that often as well. Uh, people saying, but listen, I've been paying my bond now. It's a new bond. I've been paying it for six months, let's say 15,000 a month, uh, which would be 90,000 Rand if I <laughs> quickly do my calculations, but my bond amount only reduced by 10,000. Yeah. And that's exactly why it is, because at the beginning, the portion of the capital that you're paying is, is so little, the rest only interest and you have to be be very uh, aware of that um, I think and and I think now we, we're pretty much going to get into the the meat of the the conversation and really get into the weeds now and that is the different entities to buy property in um, so I find a lot of people, obviously, they buy in, in their personal names. 
uh, as an individual and that at, at some point they get to a situation, oh, should have been in a company or m must we now buy property in, in a trust? How does that work? What's the impact of these entities? Are there certain properties, uh, i.e. a residential property that you're your primary residence that you should buy in your personal name and then your investment properties in a different entity? There's so many different things and, and lots of times, and I see people as well, where they married in community of property. They've bought five or six properties over 10 or 15 years. One of them, husband or wife, majorly successful now. And now they've got all these properties at risk, being married in community of property. If something like COVID comes along, then you can lose all those properties. Um, so firstly, if, if, if you can maybe touch on the different vehicles to, to buy property in. And then I would like to get in uh, into the, the perfect scenario. Um, if you can, if a, a, a young couple comes to you, they're married, they have, maybe they've already bought a primary residence or they will buy a, a primary residence, so they're thinking about it now, but they both successful, they've got big salaries or they've got a successful business. So they are thinking about buying five or, or 10 investment properties, rental properties over the next 10 or 15 years. What would the, the perfect model, in your opinion, uh, be for, for something like that? Yeah, Francois, I think that's an, an interesting question. I'm, and I'm gonna start with the basics and then, and then probably just, just work into that model a little bit. Um, let's start with a primary residence. So the residence that you and your family are staying in. I am, you know, uh, of the opinion that a primary residence, you need to keep in your own name. The house that I stay in with my wife, Ilana, and my three kids, um, my wife and I uh, own that, property 50-50. It's in both our names. We married out of community of property, but with the accrual. So, um, you know, there is a little bit of risk mitigation in there, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But the big reason for that is the fact that firstly, you know, that property is not going to increase in value too much. But secondly, the increase in value that I do get, the first two million profit that I make on this property when I sell it is tax-free because it is the property that I live in and the government doesn't want to tax us on just the normal growth on that property every year because if you're going to need to probably buy another property with the money that you uh, that you get out of your primary residence so the thinking was never to to go and tax again on that if it's more than two million rand obviously you will need to pay a little bit of uh, of capital gains tax on that then but i think the general viewer won't make a, a profit of two million on their residential property quickly um, so i would say keep that in your own name if you are married out of community of property and there is one of the two uh uh, the wife or the husband has a higher risk profile than the other. In other words, they have their own business, they need to sign surety for things or whatever the case might be. Then it might be worth it to look at buying it in the less risky uh, spouse's name. Um, but I think that's something that you need to get proper advice on. But as a rule of thumb, primary residence in your own name to get the two million rand. Um, yeah capital gains tax exclusion. Um, then in South Africa, um, we have certain other uh, legal entities which you could use to buy property. Uh, the first one is a private company, or PTY Limited. Um, well, to, well, we can um, go into the detail of how you need to register that and so on, but I don't think we want to do that today. Um, you can get advice on that. The big thing with a PTY Limited is that the tax rate in, in that entity is 27%. Whereas the highest tax rate that an individual will pay is 45% if you're earning about 1.7 million or 1.8 million or more. But from about seven or 800,000, you are already paying tax at 41%, which is a high um, 
a high tax rate. So in a company, there's a straight 27% tax rate, which is a lot less than uh, the 41 that an individual pays. Um, and that's why quite often it is, if you're looking at building a portfolio, it might be a good idea to have a look at a company um, where the tax rate is lower. Um, then we also have trusts and without getting into too much detail about trusts, um, what I would maybe just like to say about trusts is that if you are going to set up a trust, make sure that you get proper advice and that you fully understand how a trust works and why it is beneficial to have a trust because there are a myriad of misconceptions about <laughs> trusts and the way they work and how you need to use them and so on out there. And there are certain financial implications also with regards to trust. So, so get proper advice about that. But you can hold a property in a trust. A trust's tax rate is 45%, which is high. Um, and even on a capital gains, from a capital gains point of view, you know, trust pays capital gains tax on 80% of the capital gains. So you might end up at 80% or 45%, that's about a 36% hit. Now, once again, without getting into detail, you know, you are able to, um, to move out some of those capital gains to beneficiaries and, and so on, but um, you will need to get personalized advice on, on that. If we have a look at what I would recommend as a, as a perfect structure, then what I would say is the following. Um, if you are buying your first investment property and <clears throat> you are a normal salary earner, but you can, <coughs> sorry, you can see yourself building up a portfolio, but very gradually, you know, you might buy a property now and you're probably looking at only buying the second one in five or six or seven years time. Then I would say, keep it simple. Buy the property in your name or in your spouse's name. Um, you know, deal with the, the income tax on, on the property in, in yourself or in your spouse's name and, 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 and just get to know the whole process without incurring the further costs or the admin of having another legal entity involved in this. If you are buying your second, third, fourth property, or you are really you're looking at buying more than one property, or you can see yourself, you know, buying a property every year or so, then I would say, okay, but let's look at setting up a structure. And for me, um, the perfect structure would be to, to set up a trust, um, and, but to not buy the property in the trust itself. So I would typically go and set up a trust and then set up a private company, uh, PTY Limited. Um, though the shares of this PTY Limited, so the, 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 the entity that owns this PTY Limited, then needs to be this trust that you've just set up. So the, the benefit of that is the fact that you still get the 27% tax rate on this, um, on this income, but the capital growth um, on the um, properties is outside of your and your wife's personal estates. Um, and that is beneficial because the day that the last one of you passes away, SARS is going to want 20% of the value of your estate that is over 7 million. Um, so once again, you know, this bit gets very technical, go and get advice about it, but that is the general rule of thumb. And that's why I would say any assets that you have that will grow in value, which we really hope property will do, move them out of your personal estate under a structure where there's a trust, but not directly in a trust. I like to have a trust in place merely as a placekeeper. The trust mustn't own any asset directly except the shares in these private companies. And you, you can set up more than one private company. I, I wouldn't go and set up one. I often get the question, do I need to buy every property in a different <laughs> Uh, private company, don't do that. Uh, you know, that's, your admin is going to become an absolute nightmare. Um, but uh, go and put them under the trust in a private company. Yeah, and 
as you said, I mean, with, with every company, there's obviously costs. I yes. mean, costs to, once again, <laughs> getting into the market and every, setting up the company, getting it registered. There's yearly, uh, you must, yearly fees that has to be, to be paid, and otherwise it goes into deregistration and, and all of those things. So that's, that's, it must be, be kept in mind. It's also gonna, gonna cost, cost you a few things. Um, I just, for, for a, a small moment, just have a, a little look at, at trust. Uh, I think there's a lot of common misconceptions about trust. I find a lot, lots of times that people refer to trusts and a trust account as in, in the same vein as if it's the, the same thing. And attorneys yeah. have trust accounts <laughs> where they keep money in, in trust, but it's got nothing to do with a trust or a family trust. And you get two types of trusts, but, but we won't get into it at all. The, the normal ones, the inter vivos trust and the mortis causa trust, but we won't, won't get into those things. But there's so, so many misconceptions. And I want us just to quickly uh, get into one, of two, one or two of those. And, and so let's look at, uh, have a look at them. So regarding trusts, I think the common idea regarding a trust that the typical South African, and maybe that's from our uh, ancestral culture is just that a trust is there to leave your property for those that for, for our kids and then um, for them not to as you say stay clear of estate duty taxes and things like that don't keep it in your personal name otherwise you're going to be taxed upon that so let's leave it for for our kids and their kids in in a trust um, how does a company work in terms of that um, you say it's better now to to buy it in a company how does that go on to future generations in, in the long term? Yeah, so if we have a look at a company, um, you know, um, a company has a shareholder and a director, or multiple shareholders and multiple directors. The director being, the, or directors being the person or persons who need to take care of the operations of the company, who need to make sure that all compliance issues are up to date, and the shareholder being the person who ultimately gets the benefit from this company. Now, if we have a look at a trust, uh, maybe just an interesting story about trust, which I think will just gives us a little bit of perspective. So the idea of a trust comes from just under a thousand years ago in the time of King Richard the Lionhearted and the Crusades, where he would often have to raise an army well, to, to, to make war on the Saracens in Jerusalem and he would get his nobles together, um, you know, the knights, and they would need to head off to Jerusalem. But um, they couldn't do so on an aeroplane. This was a journey that had to go via a boat and then via land. And, you know, it, it would take them a few years to, to get there and then to come back, in which time, obviously, somebody needed to look after the business interests of these nobles, because they would all have, um, well, big houses or castles to, uh, and, 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 and multiple properties uh, that they would own. So they would leave these properties and, and, and basically all of their affairs in trust to certain people who they trusted to um, look after the, these business interests for the benefit of their families. So that is where the idea of a trust <laughs> initially came from. And that is, in general, still the idea that we have now. So if we have a look at a trust, a trust has trustees, who are these people that need to look after the property of the trust. And it's interesting that even in our trust law or common law, you know, we still say that the assets of the trust vest in these trustees in their capacity as trust, not in the trust itself. So, um, so these people are the people who need to look after the, the properties, but don't necessarily receive the benefit of what's happening in here. The benefit goes to the beneficiaries of these trusts. And these are normally in the context that we are talking about it today, would typically be a family a husband and wife, and normally you would say their kids and probably their 
their kids' offspring at infinitum. So until um, eternity, if 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 need be. Um, so in in the the, the trust, the, the biggest advantage of the trust in in that context is the fact that it's a legal entity. It cannot pass on. Um, whereas <laughs> with individuals, obviously, we know there is a certain time where we won't be here anymore. Um, so the, the biggest value is that it is a good estate planning tool. Um, and it is a good way, a good place to leave our assets to um, our kids and our grandkids um, and, and to go and build up multi-generational wealth. And, um, and this is not the topic of today, but if you know you are a young couple, you haven't, you haven't got kids or you've maybe just got kids, um, then it's also a very useful tool to leave your estate to for the benefit of your kids. Because if your kids are minors, they cannot look after the money that is being left to them. It has to be um, parked in a certain uh, an entity and a trust is the perfect way to do that. So it can actually serve multiple uses at the same time. Uh, that's, that's a great point and I would actually love to get into that, but that's not the scope of, of today whatsoever. Uh, but just as a side note, I mean, you, you alluded or you called it estate planning. And I, I find that people do not plan whatsoever <laughs> what's going to happen with the estate. People die without a will. They uh, die intestate, which is not, not the right way to, to go about it whatsoever. And then, oh, they just get a simple will, but they've got a vast amount of, of assets and liabilities and, and things. And they didn't do actual estate planning. So it's so important to... to Firstly, just make sure you have a will. And secondly, if needs be, if you've got a, a large estate, if you've got a la large amount of interests and assets and liabilities, see someone and, and do some estate planning, whether it's an auditor, uh, a, a, an attorney, or a financial advisor, make sure he is worth his salt because not all are created equal and, and make sure those things are in place. Um, and I, there might be some viewers now, we, we've talked a, about a lot of things and some of, we, we went into the weeds of, of a few things and, and people might be a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, okay, so we've got all this information, we've got, got all these ideas, I want to get into investment property, I want to do this or that, maybe get a company or, or, or a trust, whatever the case might be. And as Tim Ferriss usually says, he says, um, I'm not a doctor and I, and I don't play one on the internet. Now, I am an attorney and you are an auditor, but I mean, we're just having a, a general conversation and for someone to get proper financial advice regarding the, these things, where should they start? I mean, even for me, I don't always know what's the difference between a, a bookkeeper and an accountant and an auditor. Who must I approach? Where's the best way to, to start and, and talk about these things? And then also what, what I find now is we commonly work together as an attorney and auditor and, and a financial advisor. Where, where does that fit in? So if you can just, for, for the common viewer or listener, where they can start, uh, how do the, these different people and personas fit, fit in together? Yeah, no, I think that's an interesting one, Francois. Um, so maybe just firstly on, on the topic of an accountant, uh, auditor, uh, and so on. Um, uh, generally in South Africa, uh, we have um, two, let's say, uh, large um, institutes of accountants and auditors. Um, the first one being SICA, the South African Institute for Chartered Accounting. If you want to be an, a chartered accountant, you need to register with them. Um, if you then want to um, give comfort to shareholders and, uh, and other parties on the financial statements of larger entities, 
that need to be audited. You need to register with a body called ERBA, the Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors. Then you have the authority to sign off an audit report, which basically says to the relevant parties looking at the financial statements of a company um, that you've had a look at the inner workings of what's going on here and that in your professional opinion, you are happy with what you've seen, basically. Um, not all chartered accountants are auditors. That's sort of a, a separate designation. You don't need a registered auditor to look after your affairs if you're investing in property. You can have a chartered accountant looking after that as well. Then we also have professional accountants who have the, the same sort of skills um, on a slightly, um, let's say, I don't want to even say more basic level, but the chartered accountant will go into a bit more detail uh, in their studies, you know, in, in, in certain areas. Then the professional accountant, but these professional accountants are also professional guys and girls. They've got a, a good qualification. They've um, written in a standard setting exam and they are typically what we would call accountants. Um, and, you know, depending on who you are dealing with, you can go and choose an accountant or an, a chartered accountant or an auditor to help you if you are looking at your property investment. I would just say, make sure that the one that you're talking to has either dabbled a bit in property themselves or has quite a few clients who do this and whom he or she gives advice to. But preferably, I would say, look for one that is a bit into property themselves because they are gonna understand the costs, the yields, and all of those things. Um, that would be my biggest proviso, actually. Um, and that actually, that's, that's something that uh, Nassim Taleb says as well, skin in the game. That, that person also, I mean, if, if you paid the price, if you paid the school fees, uh, you, you know this. There's just the difference when someone has, has the necessary skin in the game a, as well. Yeah, definitely. And maybe on your second point, uh, Francois, what, so what I see quite often in, um, out there is that um, a, a client who has a bit of wealth or is looking at building up a little bit of wealth has multiple advisors for different things, which is entirely correct. I mean, um, he'll do his life insurance and, um, you know, other um, insurances with his um, broker or his financial advisor. He will come to you for legal matters, for drawing up his uh, prenuptials, um, for for doing the the other basic things. Maybe when they want to start up or buy a company or something, they'll they'll have a chat to you, and then he or she will have a chat to their auditor about compliance things, about their accounting, and so on. But what quite often happens is that this happens in silos. So they'll go and have a chat to the one, and to the other one, and to the other one, but there won't necessarily be cohesion between these advisors. Um, and then what happens is that even though um, this is not um, what this person envisages or wants, is that these, these people, none of them have the whole picture. And so they end up um, working against each other, not because they want to, but just because with the information that they have, um, they are trying to do what they think is fit and proper for their clients. But if you can get these advisors to just talk to each other, and there's cohesion in the process, that creates a lot of value. Because from my side, for instance, I then know my client has so much life insurance, he's going to bequeath this to this or that person, or he wants to start his estate planning, now he's put up a trust, then I can advise him on what needs to go there, what we can still move, and from a legal um, you know, point of view as well. So if all, th all those advisors are pulling in the same direction, it is definitely, ultimately, the situation that you want to be in because you 
you are seriously at risk of neutralizing the effect of this advice if this happens in, in silos. Um, that, that's a, a great point and it makes a lot of sense. And we, we're heading now in the, the final straight of the conversation. And to, to wrap this up, I get, often I get comments, but okay, we, we talk about property and investment in, in property on, on most, if not all of our channels and most of our talks and, and videos are, are about property. But what about investing just in, in financial products? And you made a comment the other day that you love the, the aspect of, of financial discipline of property investment. So just, just to wrap this up, what are your, your thoughts on that? What do you love about the, the financial discipline of that? What do you, do you mean by that? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, what you learn as you're carrying on and, and working with people who do investments is that not all people are created equal. We all have different levels of discipline, I would say, when it comes to our finances. Now, if I do an investment of, of sorts where I'm putting away money every month into a fund or into a retirement annuity or any financial sort of product, then if times get a bit tough, um, it's very, e especially if it's discretionary, you know, then I need to decide to make that payment every month. Then it's as, very- As times do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as they do, yeah, especially now. Yeah. Or if I want to have a nice holiday over December, you know, then I start thinking, hey, but you know what? Maybe I should just skip this one month. Um, I'll make up for it next year and, and let me have a good time with this money, which is not wrong, um, but you have the opportunity to do that. With property, unfortunately, or I would argue in some cases, fortunately, the monthly repayment from the bank goes off every month on the 31st or the 1st or the 2nd of the month. You do not have the option to skip a month. And that creates a lot of financial discipline inherently because you know this thing is happening. Um, whether I would rather use that money to go have a holiday this month or not, it, it is going to happen. And, and, and that, you know, um, in the long term, I think is actually a nice tool um, to, to keep your investment and to keep yourself honest yeah. about your investments. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, uh, I mean, it's an, it's an awesome principle. And at the end of the day, um, we, and, and I can't remember the exact quote now and who said it, but we, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall well, we, to the level of our systems. And if you've got the systems in place, you know your investments are, are going. And I mean, I've been in that situation as well where times get tough. So what do you do? You, you skip your investment. That's the first place where you think you can, can cut a little bit of fat. Um, so having that financial discipline is, is just so important. Jonathan? This has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I really enjoyed it, loved it. Um, it was so fun talking about all, all these, these principles and I think we've, we can go on for, for hours more. And I do believe we'll most probably have a, a version two and a version three where we might get into other concepts as well and maybe look at that not the individual or residential property, but maybe a little bit more in commercial properties, uh, things like that. But that's a whole other conversation uh, whatsoever. Uh, as a last point, is there any ask or want or idea you want to leave with the listeners or viewers? Um, just the last point and, and then we can wrap it up. Yeah, Francho, firstly, from my side, once again, it's been an absolute privilege to, to be here. Um, yeah, thank you um, for that. And also looking forward to this being the first of, of hopefully many. Um, the, I think the point that I would like to leave the viewers with is that a lot of what we've spoken about can um, seem a little bit heavy. Um, but I would say, don't, don't, don't only look at that. If you have a passion for property, it's something that you like, it's something that gives you a little bit of energy, go for it. Go and buy that first property, do your homework, it doesn't need to be expensive, just start. 
It can seem overwhelming at the start, but take it step by step. Talk to a good advisor or to talk to a good agent. Take the first step and go and buy that first residential property, primary residence, or go and buy your first investment property and go and test it out. Awesome. Then just as a, as a last note where you can find Jonathan is um, at BKD Auditors on, on Facebook. Um, he is so kind that they'll create a, a specific email address as well for, for the viewers. Um, if you want to contact, contact them regarding this, this podcast, it will be property at bkdo.co.za and their website is then obviously as well bkdo. All of which would be in, in the show notes for, for all to see. Um, and then just to, to wrap this up, we just have to add that <laughs> this podcast is just for general information purposes only and does not constitute the practice of law, financial advice or services as a financial service provider, including but not limited to the giving of legal or financial advice. Uh, no attorney and or financial advisor and client relationship is formed. The use of this information and materials linked to this podcast is at the viewer's own risk. The content on this podcast is not in intended to be a substitute for pro professional legal and financial advice. And that is so important. It's just a general chat and we've shared lots of ideas. But to get into the nitty gritty, obviously you've got a specific situation, you've got specific finances, your marital regime, and please seek professional advice on those. Please do not disregard or delay in obtaining legal and financial advice from an attorney, financial advisor, or an auditor, depending on and regarding your situation and your finances. Um, it's been an absolute blast and I hope to see you in the next one. These sponsors make our podcast possible. So if you like us, like them. Uh, please go and support them, show your support, like, follow, subscribe on their social media channels. All are linked here in below. Visit their website and you are more than welcome to contact them if you need their assistance.